Hi everyone, this is the third lecture of week 10. And again, to keep up with your readings, um, especially in this week, um, if you are not doing the biblical readings, sometimes the lectures are not gonna make as much sense to you. Um, so this is all a way to say, especially at the end of the course, you want to be reading the biblical text. Otherwise, it is going to be pretty hard to know what I'm talking about in the videos. Um, and it me, like I said, um, your quizzes might ask you questions that I don't go over that is only apparent if you do the readings, okay? Um, so last time we left off, David had risen up the ranks so much so that he had to flee Saul, who, because, you know, rightly so, has become quite suspicious of the, you know, new David. Uh, and with the help of Saul's family members, we are told that David is, uh, successfully escapes. And in 1 Samuel 19, 18, we are told that the first place or person that he runs to is, interestingly, Samuel, who is at Ramah, okay, indicating, of course, that the Civil War now, um, it has officially started with Samuel siding uh, with David, okay? However, we are told that uh, Saul finds out where David is hiding and therefore David has to flee again. And, and, and this is where he flees to in 1 Samuel 21. And notice, right, um, where he goes and how, who these people are, okay? So 1 Samuel 21 uh, verses one and following. Okay, uh, David came to know uh, to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech came to David, came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to the priest Ahimelech, the king has charged me with the matter and said to me, no one must know about anything about the matter about which I will send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what have you at hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David and said, I have no ordinary bread at hand, only holy bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from uh, women. And David answered the priest and said, indeed, yeah, uh, you know, the women have been kept from us as always when we go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is a common journey, how much more today when their vessels be holy. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no other bread except the bread of the presence, which was removed from the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, the Edomite the chief of Saul's shepherds. And David said to Ahimelech, is there no spear or sword here with you? I did not bring my sword and or weapons with me because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here wrapped in a cloth behind the aphid. If you take it, take it for there's none except that one. And David said, there is none like it, give it to me. Um, so what is happening here is all extremely, uh, very, very, very suspicious, okay? The priest at Nob, we are told, comes out trembling and therefore seems to know that something important is going on and scary. So why, you know, why, you know, otherwise he wouldn't be afraid, right? Okay. Um, yet despite, despite this suspicion, or perhaps because he knows exactly what's going on, he readily hands over to David food, holy bread meant only for God, okay, as well as weapons, you know, this, uh, you know, sword of Goliath, which is akin to like Santa Anna's leg in Texas, right, all these special items without, notice how he hands them over without asking David a whole lot of important questions, okay, he just takes David's word that he's on a mysterious, unstatable mission, okay, um, and this seems to hint that Ahimelech knows exactly what's going on, right? But he doesn't want to uh, find out more knowledge of what's going on so that he can feign ignorance, right? Plausible deniability, okay? Moreover, um, the name of Ahimelech, you know, what he does, right? I.e., he's a priest, and his name suggests some interesting things going on in the country, right? Ahimelech's name means my brother is king or brother of the king, Okay. So likely he is a family member of Saul, right? And it's probably Saul who has placed another family member in this high position, okay? So notice that again, another family member is helping David, right? While knowing exactly what David is up to. That Ahimelech is a very high up religious official is telling, right? Especially considering that David first flees to another religious official, Samuel. Okay, and all of this hints that the religious, uh, you know, the religious section, right, for some reason has turned against Saul and is now on the side of David. Okay, um, now, of course, the biblical 
text wants you to think that all oh, these religious people have sided with David because they are religious and pious and, you know, David's you know, obviously fighting, you know, for God and so forth. Um, it's probably a lot more secular than that, honestly. You know, likely these religious officials um, probably either made an agree uh, agreement with David or thought certainly that they can make a better deal, make more money, have more power under David and, uh, you know, than under Saul. And that's probably why they come to David's side, not some kind of, you know, actually pious reason, okay? Um, now, Saul, again, you know, for all the propaganda saying that he is out of it and doesn't get, you know, understand what's happening, you know, he seems to be highly aware of what's going on, okay? Um, you know, and, and, and you, you know, in that, right, by 1 Samuel 22, verse 6, uh, we are told that Sa Sa Saul is keenly aware that his family, and indeed even his clan, or his tribe is siding with David and therefore decides to warn what will happen if David, a Judean, someone from the tribe of Judah, a Judahite, comes to power, right? Namely, you know, he warns his family, look, you're going to lose all this plum position that you're in. Okay, and it is only after kind of, you know, Saul warning them about you know, how they're going to lose uh, their plum position that um, Doag, right, this Edomite who happens to be around the priest at No or the temple at No or the shrine at No finally confesses and says, oh, well, I did see something a little suspicious. You know, I did see the priest at No, you know, giving David a weapon and provisions. Okay, and it is at this point that Saul sends for the priest at No and, and notice how they are all described as family members. Numbers, right? And this is what happens in verse uh, 1 Samuel 22, uh, verse 11 and following. The king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and for all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, listen, now son of Ahitub. And he answered, here I am, my lord. And the Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, by giving him bread and the sword and by inquiring of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as he is doing today? And then Ahimelech answered the king, who among all your servants is so faithful as David? He is the king's son-in-law and is quick to do your bidding and is honored in your house. This today the first time I have inquired of God for him. By no means do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any member of my father's house. For your servant has known nothing of all of this, much or little. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Okay. The point of this passage, obviously, is to portray Saul as an impious, you know, almost a religious prosecutor, okay, and thereby offer a justification for why God allowed Saul's throne to be usurped, okay. What is weird, however, is that the writers want to both portray Saul as killing innocent priests, while also trying to show that the priests, as because they were God's functionaries, were also on David's side, okay, so there's this kind of tension here. Okay, notice that when Saul asks the priest why the priests have conspired against him, Ahimelech does not really answer the question, but like instead talks about how great David is. Oh, you know, your, you know, but your guy David is so, so, so faithful to you. Okay, uh, yet notice, you know, uh, how bad Ahimelech is at addressing the charges. Okay, either as if Ahimelech knows it's all over, doesn't matter what he says, or that the writers were kind of caught in a corner. Okay, they wanted uh, I, you, that is the reader, to know that Ahimelech also sided with David. Okay, therefore Ahimelech instead is presented as kind of a bumbling idiot, unable to address any of the questions that Saul asked him. Okay, Saul, in response to this obvious lie by Ahimelech, of course, commands that all of the priests at Nob uh, be killed, probably for treason, which seems to be correct here, and which of course is quite legal. But of course, we are told that the only person who is willing to kill a bunch of priests is the foreigner Doeg, right? Um, uh, so, and uh, which is what he does, right? Some scholars have argued that the story indicates that there was some kind of break in the relationship between Saul and the Eli group. Okay, I mean, maybe it's just really hard to know underneath all the propaganda what's real and what's not. Okay, um, it, it, however, not all of the priests at Nob are killed. Okay, there is almost always one who survives to tell the tale. Okay, and, and here too, uh, we have this uh, young priest named Abiathar who uh, survives the massacre. How it's not quite clear, who rallies to David and becomes um, a very important priest in uh, the Davidic court, right? 
Um, he too will side with the wrong heir, right? Um, he will side against Solomon and again be exiled. So notice how these priests and religious, uh, religious officials, how they're deeply enmeshed in the politics, okay? In the stories that follow, and again, this is why it's important for you to read the text, right? <clears throat> David and Saul uh, play this uh, game of cat and mouse for a very long, <laughs> lengthy amount of narrative. Okay? And all the while, again, I am condensing what is a very complicated text, all the while, right, while the, you know, Saul is kind of chasing him through the country, it seems, David is doing some key things. Okay? First, we are told in various parts of the text that David keeps fleeing to Israel's enemies, such as the Philistines. Okay? And of course, though it makes it seem like David was so desperate and had to flee to the Philistines, Scenes, you know, more likely this seems to hint that David, uh, you know, is going over and making, either getting the, Israel's enemies on his side or cutting deals with them, okay? Maybe when he comes to the throne, they'll be treated better or something like that, okay? Um, second, we are told that alongside running to his enemies, um, David is, um, has gathered around himself some mysterious men, numbering around 400 people. Okay, this is in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. That's a lot of random people. More likely, this is insinuating that David now has formed a small renegade army or rival military force. Okay, lastly, uh, and maybe most importantly, we are also told that while David is on the run, notice how he's still on the run while all this, okay, uh, David is off marrying some key, rich, and very well-connected women. Okay, and once such well-connected women and well-connected or important marriage uh, or the story thereof is found in 1 Samuel 25, which is a very complicated, really interesting tale. And it describes, uh, again, I have to summarize very quickly, unfortunately. 1 Samuel 25 tells of how once upon a time, there was this very rich man in Carmel whose name was Nabal. And in Hebrew, Nabal means an idiot, okay, or a fool, or boorish, or ill-behaved, okay, so this is not really a good name, okay. And we are told that Nabal, the fool, is married to, however, yet a very small, smart, and good wife named Abigail. Okay. And when David, who has been hanging around Nabal's territories, realizes that Nabal is gonna, Nabal's whole household is going to have this big party, big celebration, okay? this is what David does, we are told, in 1 Samuel 25, verse 5. So David sent 10 young men, and so David said to the young men, go to Carmel and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name, and, and thus you shall salute him. Peace be to you, peace be to your house. Peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we didn't do them any harm. And they missed nothing. All the time they were in Carmel, ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your sight, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at your hand to your servant and to your son, David. Okay, notice how Godfather like this is. Okay, um, despite you know his name, and despite how much land Nabal, you know, uh, runs right. It, you know, it, it, yeah, I'm sorry. Despite the meaning of Nabal's name, considering how rich he seems to be, considering how much land he uh, it, it seems to govern, right? Um, Nabal was probably the leader um, or some high power person in that area. Some people think that he was kind of like a governor of Carmel, which is a very rich, lush area. Okay. And of course, this is in the midst of David slowly taking um, over parts of the country. Okay. And, and what David seems to have been doing while he's on the run from Saul is that he appears to have been either threatening rich landowners to come to his side or killing them and taking their land over. Okay. David is basically your um, mafia boss. And what's really happening with David and Saul is really a kind of mafia battle. Okay. Of course, Nabal um, does not recognize this, right? And he refuses to pay David's protection money, this is or bribe, which is what this is, and even calls David a traitor, which is what David actually is, right? And so at, at this point, David realizing that uh, Nabal is not going to play, his game, um, he decides to go kill Nabal and everyone affiliated with him. So notice the quickness with which David resorts to violence, right? Um, now, when Abigail, we are told, Nabal's wife, who is very clever, very bright, realizes that Nabal, her husband, has just insulted David, the new thug in town, 
She runs out to meet David, bringing with her lots of presents and lots of food. And then she says some very interesting things in her conversation with David. And this is going to be quite lengthy, okay? Um, so just prepare yourself, okay? So this is what happens in 1 Samuel 25, 23 and following. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and alighted from her donkey and fell down before David on her face, bowing to the ground until she fell at his feet and said, Upon me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. My Lord, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow, Nabal, for so is his name, so he is. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, since the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance on your own uh, hand, now let my enemy and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be like Nabal, and let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord and please forgive the trespass of your servant for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live if anyone should rise up to pursue you and to seek your life the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God but the lives of your enemies be uh, he shall sling out as a hollow of a sling. Okay? And when the Lord has done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over is Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pains of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for having saved himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Okay? I read this really very fast. Again, I would highly, highly advise that you look over uh, 1 Samuel 25, okay? In essence, what Abigail tells David is that um, a couple of very key interesting things. She says, I didn't realize you were the new guy in charge. I do now. Not only that, I know that you are going to be the new king, right? Again, showing everybody in Israel knows that a civil war is now afoot. Okay. Um, she also keeps telling David, interestingly, um, to not incur blood guilt, okay? That is, don't let your hands get all bloody, right? Or don't let your hands be seen as tinged with guilt, blood guilt, okay? And uh, she also, interestingly or oddly, mentions slingshot abilities, right? And also at the very end, to remember her, okay? And notice how this is all, there's some other message going on and how this sounds really, really strange until you look at the way that the Nabal her husband dies, okay? And of course, he ends up dead, right? We are told that when Abigail is out, literally saving everyone's lives and their farm, right? Nabal has been up to no good drinking, right? This is what it says in 25, uh, verse 36 and following. Abigail came to Nabal, and he was holding a big feast in his house, like the feast of a king, okay? Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk, so she told him nothing at all until the morning light, and in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became like a stone, and ten days later the Lord struck Nabal, and he died, okay? So a couple of weird things, right? Notice that um, Abigail says nothing until morning, uh, that is until he is sober, but when he is sober, she tells him what happened, and then he seems to like have a stroke or a heart attack, but for whatever reason, it takes 10 days for Yahweh to kill him, okay? Notice all the weird language about his death. It states that his heart became like a stone, which is weird, okay? And it's weird until you start thinking about um, some of these weird little references, this reference that Abigail says uh, about Nabal being like a king, okay? This reference even to a stone, what are stones used for and where have we seen stones before, okay? And we have seen stones before, especially in 1 Samuel, right? Where, oh right, when David picks out five smooth stones to use in his sling, to take down Goliath, right? And, and this is also very weird because remember in Abigail's speech, which I realized I read very fast, she mentions slingshots earlier there, okay? Oh, and what happens once Nabal, the rich guy, dies? Well, it so happens that David does remember Abigail and everything she told him as she told him to do, and somehow Abigail ends up with a much better second husband, David himself, 
okay, who, as she predicted, does end up becoming the next king, okay. Aside, aside from this being a, a pretty delightful tale, um, there are some fascinating insinuations here, okay, and it hints that women were just as good, perhaps, or, or um, maybe just as keen, okay, at playing politics as the men, okay, that they are not really, you know, these, these female characters are not reducible to kind of good or bad, right, they are just very human, very complicated, okay. Um, so, and, and Abigail seems to have been quite a good politician, okay? All of this stuff about Abigail's, you know, wink-wink conversation with David, where she tells him, you know, don't get your own hands messy, never get your hands messy, right? Where she mentions that he'll succeed, that God will make disappear David's enemies as if there are stones in a sling, right? And telling uh, him to remember her when everything turns out magically well for David, right? All of this seems to insinuate that Abigail has something to do with the murder of Nabal, okay? The text hints that Abigail, indeed, there might have been rumors, right, um, that Abigail was accused of, um, or there were rumors of Abigail having poisoned Nabal in order to help David obtain the ownership of Nabal's land and the riches of that land, okay? That is Nabal's estate. Okay, remember that Abigail, whose husband Nabal is mysteriously killed off by God. Notice how he's like not just a normal guy, he's filthy rich, right? And the text never says what happened to his property once he died. Likely it went to David, okay? Hence, this story tries to justify how David gained power, riches, very important key tracts of land, and very key politically important marriages and alliances, okay? Indeed, Abigail is not the only important wife David will get, okay? We saw earlier how David is up married to McCall and takes her back. Well, at the very end of the story in chapter 25, 1 Samuel 25, in verse 43, we are told that David also married Ahinoam of Jezreel. So you're like, okay, big deal. Who is Ahinoam? Well, well, interestingly, Ahinoam is mentioned once before in 1 Samuel 14, verse 50. And this is what it states. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz. Okay. Ahinoam seems to have been an ex-wife, a former wife of Saul. Okay. Which is, so notice what David is doing. David is slowly collecting very important politically connected rich women okay um and, and and what all this hints of course is that women were a key uh to david's rise in power okay now um yeah while david is doing this that is acquiring soldiers politically connected wives riches property strangely making friends with foreign leaders of neighboring enemy countries okay the same ones that saul is out there fighting um the text however repeatedly states how david never 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 won the throne okay he never positioned himself you know indeed he never tried to get rid of saul okay indeed we are told that david is given uh, a chance to kill saul twice but never does it okay no rather for some mysterious reason everyone loves david and helps him out okay and saw well saul's just jealous and paranoid okay he's not thinking right because he's afflicted with this evil spirit um, notice how much protesting there is too much protesting here okay likely david probably rose to power because he made key alliances with members of the royal family who turned against, against Saul, as well as uh, key alliances with priests and prophetic components, as well as the enemies of neighbors of Israel, okay? Indeed, at the end of 1 Samuel, we are told that Saul had to actually stop chasing David. Why? Because the Philist Philistines, right, um, were now starting to attack again or encroach again. Okay, and this um, little note it kind of hints as to, re as to the real reason why Saul lost the throne to David, right? And it's because he had to deal with a two-pronged threat, right? He had to deal with this David guy who's trying to usurp his throne, so an internal threat, as well as an external threat by enemy groups, okay? With so many siding against, side, uh, against Saul, he is actually, like, he is doomed, okay? However, again, like I said, the winners get to write the history. Okay, and, and what they keep saying is, no, 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 David just magically ended up on the throne. Yes, there's bodies all around, but David had nothing to do with that. And notice how in that portrayal, David has really taken to heart um, Abigail's message, right? Remember, she says, yeah, yeah, don't be the one to get caught with a gun in your hand, right? Let somebody else do the dirty work. And this is indeed what David will continue to do.